the Rubicon Masonic Society presents the Classic Masonic Authors Conference of 2023. Produced by BT Media Productions. The 20th century produced many of Freemasonry's greatest writers. Incredibly, we find ourselves now reaching the end of the first quarter of the 21st century. Regrettably, the lapse of time has obscured the brilliant works of too many of these men. Complicating matters is the manner in which men in contemporary society receive and process information. The great writers of the 20th century produced works that were intentionally tactile, books, magazines, pamphlets, and the like. 21st century readers are perhaps more familiar with e-books, downloads, and other digital delivery systems. The disconnect in the information delivery methods of the two centuries creates the risk that the significant works created in the 20th century will be passed over by more contemporary researchers and writers, and that the wisdom and sage counsel of these great men will be unfamiliar to Masons of the 21st century. In August of 2023, the Rubicon Masonic Society, Lexington Lodge No. 1, and William O. Ware Lodge of Research, along with other co-sponsors, offered a symposium known as the Classic Masonic Authors of the 20th Century Conference. The purpose of the conference was to preserve the works of four of the most well-known Masonic authors of the 20th century, and to bring these men and their writings back to center stage and the spotlight. 21st century Freemasons were invited to discover for the first time or reacquaint themselves with the works of Andrew Somerville McBride, Joseph Fort Newton, Dwight L. Smith, and Thomas W. Jackson. The following are presentations made about each of those men and their works. There is a bright thread that ties the work of these four men together. That thread is the theme of Masonic education, given at the time that it is most meaningful. That time is as a man moves through the degrees. Rather than rushing men through the degrees of Masonry, McBride, Newton, Smith and Jackson, all advocated a more measured approach grounding men in the historic philosophy and purpose of Freemasonry as they moved through the degrees and all sought to make Masons, not merely members. Let us rediscover their ideas now, brought to the forefront again for the benefit of Masons of the 21st century. The work of Andrew Somerville McBride is presented by Andrew Hammer. The work of Joseph Fort Newton is presented by Dan M. Kemble. The work of Dwight L. Smith is presented by Christopher L. Hodap. And the work of Thomas W. Jackson is presented by John W. Bizak. McBride. McBride was perhaps the greatest figure in the history of Scots Freemasonry. He was an authority on history and jurisprudence. Most notably, he was a compiler and arranger of ritual. Lastly, he was a noted author. His most enduring work, Speculative Masonry, reflects his perceptions as to Masonry's harmony with natural law, its continuing evolution, and its ultimate progression to the construction of a temple of brotherhood and peace. McBride's work is a timeless Masonic book, and the earnest-minded Mason will return to it time and again because of its power and uniqueness. McBride's writing never grows tiresome, and there are no lines to read between in speculative masonry. I'm here to speak about Andrew Somerville McBride. The natural response to that statement is who? And that makes sense because the book Speculative Masonry is one of those books that you find in some Masonic libraries that have the books stuffed so tightly together 
that it tells you that no one's been reading them. But the book is in many lodges and libraries in this country because it has been released before here, not only in Scotland. So who? Well, who is McBride? Why would you be interested in McBride? Well, take a look at him. Who would not want to be interested in such a distinguished Victorian gentleman? Is he not the embodiment of what we envision some of us when we think of a distinguished Mason? One hopes. So just by looking at this, this man whose image is almost uh, talismanic at this point, you can see why that would stimulate some interest. But I'd never seen the man when I encountered the book. When I encountered the book at a very late date, 2016. 113 years after, 103 years after he published the book. So let's talk a bit about McBride and why one feels he's important. Brethren, in any generation of the craft, there seems to be at least one Masonic author who calls out our fraternity for not being all that it is promised to be and then offers a remedy to fulfill that promise. Now, the list of such men is long, and the concerns they express vary, but the intention of each order appears to be the same, to improve the state of Freemasonry so that it matches the expectations of its adherents. And before your imagination wanders too much on this point, let's establish that among these authors are brothers with names like William Preston, Albert Mackey, Walter Leslie Wilmhurst, Joseph Fort Newton, Dwight Smith, and the author of this book, Speculative Masonry, Andrew McBride. Now, although it might be said that he's one of the least known Masonic figures in the world, the curious thing about Andrew McBride is that he is one of the most highly regarded Masons among those who do know his work. Some have even said that he was the greatest Scottish Mason. He was born into a working-class family in Renton, Outside of Glasgow in 1843, he was raised by a single mother after the age of three, and at age eight, he began his working life as a railway clerk. So despite his obvious hardship, McBride is one of those people who is autodidactic by nature, meaning for people like me that he teaches himself and taught himself because he's interested in almost everything. He becomes a voracious reader, and as he moves from the railway to become a bricklayer, then a builder, then a partner in one of the leading textile firms in Scotland, he is at the same time studying literature, science, theology, and law by means of his hard-earned personal library. From his mother, he also acquired a knowledge of Scots Gaelic. So by the time he's proposed to be a Mason, at the age of 22, McBride is well known by his peers as a man whose mind did not stop working. And his Masonic life, while it begins in the same way as it did for most of us, soon becomes as remarkable as the rest of his life had been up to that point. In November of 1866, just six months after being initiated, passed, and raised in Lodge Leave in St. John, number 170, He's elected secretary of the lodge. One year later, after he and other brothers protested that the lodge had violated their Grand Lodge law by conferring an unauthorized degree, the brethren elected him master, a position he then held for the next seven years. Certainly no one today who has a concern for the health of the craft would suggest that any man imitate that meteoric example, but it is here that the Masonic labor of Andrew McBride begins in earnest. Over the next three years, McBride puts his young lifetime of study to work in the service of Freemasonry, and by 1870, he has rewritten the ritual of his lodge and produced what is known today as the McBride Ritual. Now, that is the historical statement of what took place. The context within and around that statement is where the story lies. I understand that Masons in some grand jurisdictions throughout the world might be confused by the notion of a brother 
taking the initiative to revise anything involving the sonic ritual. But what Mammon has to understand is that, unlike most grand lodges in the English-speaking Masonic world, lodges in Scotland have the right to write, revise, and adopt their own ritual. They have always had this right before the Grand Lodge era. So McBride's action in this regard is not really what's exceptional. The result is what's exceptional. The ritual that McBride's Mother Lodge had been using was based upon a handwritten copy of Preston's illustrations of masonry that had accumulated various errors over the years. Additionally, as far as Scottish masonry is concerned, Preston, who is writing in 1772, actually, in the Scottish mind, is a later author, who, despite being the Scotsman himself, had moved to London and made his Masonic mark in English Freemasonry. The specific details of what was contained in those copied handwritten notes are elusive, but there was perhaps a sense among some brethren in the lodge that the English influence in the Scottish craft may have become too strong. So McBride, in setting about the task of correcting the errors he found in the handwritten notebook, also sought to restore the ritual to what he determined to be a more Scottish footing. Yet here it must be said that the McBride ritual, while being consistent with what any mason would recognize as the same ceremonies performed by any regular lodge, is in certain aspects significantly different even from the standard or so-called standard Scottish rituals that many lodges use under the Scottish constitution today. Students of ritual may also be wary of the fact that the work was created at such a relatively late date in the development of the fraternity. But it behooves us to consider what the state of Masonic ritual was in some places at the same time that McBride was making his revision. Many Masons may be unaware that much of the ritual work today in American Grand Lodges, even though it came from a mosaic of earlier sources, was not finally codified until the 1870s. Arguments went on continuously throughout the 1800s over the issue of a standardized ritual. Through the era of the Morgan Affair, then the Baltimore Convention, then the Civil War, American Masons struggled with what final form their respective rituals would take. So by 1870, although published monitorial works and exposures had been available for over a hundred years, what many lodges had for ritual was also based upon similar handwritten copies of notes and lectures accumulated over time. These may have been indirectly received from any number of sources in the British Isles, named and unnamed, or in America, passed down from Thomas Smith Webb, then depending on where one was located, those were modified by Jeremy Cross or John Barney or maybe another itinerant lecturer, occasionally with a bit of Thaddeus Mason Harris and other earlier sources added in between. The ritual of the Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia was not finally, finally decided upon until 1869. And in that process, one finds curiously that elements of emulation ritual from the UGLE were brought in at that late date that are not found today in other American Grand Lodges. So, McBride is crafting his ritual at the same time that masonry is beginning its modern renaissance everywhere in the late 19th century, the period of time which would truly bring us all to where we are today. Now, to say all this is not to suggest that we should all go about writing our own rituals today, or, and nor is it to say that we should not be informed by earlier possibly undiscovered workings from before the Grand Lodge era. The point to be taking, taken is that ritualistically, in terms of understanding complete plans, complete plans from Masonic ritual, almost everything we do, with a few notable exceptions, was in some way revised, rearranged, or honed in the late 19th century. So in this sense, the McBride ritual is not an entirely different piece of work. Any Mason, particularly ones familiar with the form of work in the British Isles, will feel at home observing the operation of the McBride Lodge. To be sure, the opening will impress him, and the degree ceremonies, in my humble opinion, will leave him speechless. Yet everything within this work is entirely Masonic, based upon things well known to any bright Mason. What then is the McBride ritual, and how is it different? Well, 
while it could be difficult to talk effectively about ritual without divulging the ritual itself, hopefully the explanation I will offer briefly can give a sense of why this ritual has been perceived through the years as one of the treasures of Freemasonry. In 1917, the renowned American Masonic author, past Grand Chaplain of the Grand Lodge of Iowa, Joseph Fort Newton, who we'll be talking about later today, he remarked in his exemplary magazine, The Builder, that, quote, the ritual prepared by McBride comes nearer to our ideal of what a Masonic ritual should be, alike in accuracy, dignity, and beauty of form, and depth and suggestiveness of meaning than any we have ever seen. Close quote. McBride sets about to accomplish three things in his ritual. One, to further explain the meaning of the ritual through the ritual itself. Two, to make clear to everyone present, from the candidate to the most senior past master, the meaning of the ceremonies by explaining them as the candidate is going through them. And three, to make sure that the ritual abilities of the Lodge do not suffer in future by engaging a maximum number of office bearers in the work. Every office bearer in a McBride Lodge must be a ritualist, or at least willing to become one. The stewards have lines in the opening of the Lodge. Their relationship with the junior warden is expressed during that opening in such a way that no steward of a Lodge can ever be in doubt as to what he is supposed to do, what his duties are. The junior deacon has, as a part of his duties, what would equate to what others of us might call the first part of the Entered Apprentices Lecture in the Preston Web work. The wardens have exponentially more to say than in any other English language ritual to my knowledge. The language of McBride accomplishes the admirable goal of being ornate, while at the same time doing nothing more adventurous than explaining the same elements and principles known to any symbol at large, so many of which go unexplained to thousands of men who have gone through our degrees over the ages. The difference with McBride is that there is more explanation, more of an effort to communicate to the candidate as well as to all brothers present what it is that the candidate is meant to take from the ceremonies. It is meant to install a genuine passion for the craft in every brother and put the teachings of masonry at the forefront of every Masonic meeting. Now the natural question that follows that statement is, well, okay, if this ritual is so powerful, so moving, why then is it that less than 20 lodges in the world have ever worked it? I would offer that the explanation is not due to a lack of interest, nor any flaw in the nature of the work itself, but maybe because it challenges every officer in the, in the lodge from the moment <clears throat> he accepts the office. It also involves more work than almost any other English-speaking ritual I'm aware of, and just as with any other discipline in life, there are very few students who will say to their teachers, give me more work to do so that I can challenge myself in this course. The McBride ritual is certainly a challenge for any lodge, but even more of a challenge to do it well. And as masonry suffers from the same ills that plague all other human endeavors, despite our exhortations to go further and be better than what is expected from the profane world, it's no surprise that a ritual that asks for more, not less, from the quarries would not be the most popular new thing to arrive on the scene. But an even more human explanation speaks to the culture of Scotland itself. To paraphrase Robert Burns, it is a nation of men of independent minds, and therefore most Scottish lodges are quite independent. They already have a ritual they're comfortable with and don't want to bother with taking on a new one. Proselytizing is not the point of any ritual in Scotland. Each lodge finds its way as best it can. So then, we come to the question of why McBride made his revision. Surely it wasn't just a matter of replacing an old notebook. McBride enters Freemasonry at a time where he observes that, quote, the beauty and truths of masonry were being drowned in a Bacchanalian flood. All about him, he finds that the craft has neglected its symbolism, 
It has neglected its obligation to instruct the brethren in what that symbolism has to teach, and as a result has become little more than a social exercise that expedites the actual purpose of a Masonic meeting in order that men can get to the libations that follow it. To his mind, the neglect of knowledge has led to a neglect of decorum, which has subsequently led to a neglect of everything, which was the very crisis that put him in the Oriental share in the first place. McBride's not writing ritual for the sake of writing ritual. He's writing with the voice of someone who is confronting all of the same issues, but also seem to confront every generation of men who join our ranks. That voice and those issues are fully expressed in speculative masonry, its mission, evolution, and landmarks, his only substantial published work aside from the ritual. Published almost a half century after the ritual, it's not simply a creation of the moment, but rather a compilation of earlier notes and observations on the craft and its teachings accumulated, hewed, and polished over the span of his Masonic life. In the book, McBride, without saying so specifically, gives the reader an idea as to why he might have felt the need to create the ritual working that bears his name. He says, Why is it that so many sensible and intelligent men, after being initiated, drop out of the ranks and become lapsed members? Is it merely the pure cussedness of human nature, or selfishness, fickleness, or laziness? If we look closely into the matter, we will find we cannot lay this flattering unction to our souls. Is the large work so honestly and intelligently conducted that there is no excuse for the non-attendance of absent members or for the ignorance of those present? Masonry today has too many members who are not Masons because the work of too many lodges is not Masonry. If large work was more faithfully and thoughtfully done, if more attention was given to the study of our symbols and less to mere show and harmonies, the number of our entrants might be less, but the real number of Masons in the world would be greater. Many of our beautiful symbols are scarcely heard of ever in our lodges, and only a few of our members have studied them and learned the truths they contain. Close quote. So even though speculative masonry is a collection of its author's thoughts over a span of years, something that's, that sticks out to my mind is um, uh, what I think is a very poignant irony. This book was published at the very end of 1913. Only a few months later, the world Andrew McBride and his brothers knew would find itself engaged in the First World War, and the attentions of that world would be far removed from the lessons of Freemason. Yet the interpretations of the craft offered in the book and the ritual offered by McBride itself deal more directly and consistently with man's coping with mortality than possibly any other Masonic ritual system. It's almost as if fate and the mind of the author combined at the dawn of the modern world to bring the question of death, which in the 20th century became both more horrifying and more instant, more plainly into focus in the experience of the large. Indeed, death is a focal point in every degree in McBride's working. Man's mortality is demonstratively brought to the attention of the apprentice, carried through to the craftsman, and explained in detail to the master mason, all equally balanced with the necessity of a reliance upon deity in order to cope with the inevitable gravity of our existence. But the message of speculative masonry encompasses all areas of the craft. In that beautiful linguistic style of the 19th century, McBride offers up a compendium that deals with the purpose of the craft, notions of its historical development, and perhaps most interesting for many brothers in this day and age are no-holds-barred analysis of the rules of our institution, how we arrived at them, and how we should understand the way in which they not only govern us, but how we determine them. The book is divided into three sections, mission, evolution, and landmarks. In terms of the mission of Freemasonry, he leads with a serious examination of the effect that Freemasonry is meant to have on every Mason. Within the first 10 pages of the book, McBride has deftly dismissed the superstitions of Masonry being some sort of social ideology 
and moves directly to the core of masonry as the means of constructing the temple of God within the cell. He writes, Masonry has no message for the government of the purely physical life, nor for the economic or political conditions of society or of the individual. It recognizes that the moral conditions dominate and form the key of the situation. That which is hurtful to moral life will, in the long run, be deadly to physical and social life. Let your moral life be right and all be well, and neither the individual nor society will be well until they live on the square and work at the building of the temple. But what is living on the square? Neither scientific nor philosophic knowledge is needed to make a stone square. No great intellectual capacity nor scholastic glory is required to live a true life. Certainly, knowledge is power, but the thing needful for the salvation of humanity is not power. It is the right directing of power, the dedication of all knowledge, wealth, and talent to true and noble ends, to the higher plan and purpose of life, to the co-working of the soul, true and square, with the great architect of all. McBride's outlook on the administrative function of a lodge in relation to its philosophical duty to the craft, is right in line with the thinking of observant lodges in the 21st century. With his own proximity to concerns of the 20th century that relates these concerns in a more accessible, if not better way, than 18th century Masonic writers could ever have done, McBride stands perfectly in between William Preston on the one hand and Dwight Smith on the other in declaring that masonry must be diligent in avoiding the cancer of mundane concerns and profane inclinations that continuously seek to destroy the body of Akbar. In fact, I must relate to you that when I first encountered the writing of McBride in, in 2016, I was nearly moved to tears B because this brother articulated so many of my own thoughts about Freemasonry in the same way that I felt I had done. It's that feeling that Brother Mantica alluded to last night that feeling of finding a friend through the words of an author who expresses what you yourself feel. And in fact, after reading Speculative Masonry for the first time, I had the feeling immediately thereafter that maybe I didn't need to say anything else. I found that many things that I, I had been saying for years and things that I've written and even today still plan to publish were previously articulated in some sense by McBride. Yeah, both a pleasing and an uncomfortable situation to be in. For example, as many of us today find ourselves arguing over the need to raise dues in order, to, in order to sustain our lodges or to ensure that we have enough money to provide a quality experience when we meet, McBride, writing over a hundred years ago, raises the discussion to the next level. He makes the point that some of us have come to understand through our own experience. Quoting again, To, to cure this evil of indiscriminate admission, the quack remedy of big fees is recommended. Our Masonic craft is to be sold at so much per yard or so much per degree. Our salvation is to depend on big fees. At last, in the history of mankind, the guinea is to evolve the virtues of a god, and the golden calf is to possess all the qualifications of a good candidate. This cure is worse than the disease. If high fees are needed, let them be based on financial reasons. Have as high fees as you like, but for heaven's sake remember that a millionaire may be a blackguard and that saints for the most part have practically been paupers. What then is the remedy? That effectually lies in the ballot box. Make it a reality and not a farce. Let every ball represent clear conviction and true inquiry, but the mass of members will not take this trouble. They look more to the pounds, shillings and pence prosperity of their large than to the welfare and real good of our order. This narrow and selfish view has become so common that the real function of a lodge has been lost sight of. It no longer exists for the building of the temple, but for its own little glorification and petty pride. What then should be done? There may be something better, but one thing might do good. Limit the number of initiates. Some of us are very familiar with these sentiments. Some of us realize that high dues alone will not save a lodge, nor do they make a, a lodge a good lodge. 
And this is because raising dues alone almost never addresses the core problem that allowed for dues to remain so low in the first place. I know of observant lodges today that make a big deal out of the rather gimmicky notion of a dollar a day, and yet cannot manage to do the work on their own. McBride emphasizes that this is not masonry unless you are doing the work ritually, intellectually, and spiritually. And there, from the first section of the book, he then goes on to a journey into symbolism, which begins with what he calls the law of the square, then leading into the nature of materials in the quarries and how to select them, the preparation of the lodge, and finally, the construction of the temple. Now, while these things seem very concrete, what the reader is being effectively drawn into is the thorough symbolic explanation of the degrees. One particular section on the law of the square is of note, the section entitled The Law of the Square in the Cross. And I mention this because in the matter of sectarianism, religious sectarianism and masonry, McBride succeeds where others before and after him fail miserably. Understanding that masonry is meant to be inclusive of all faiths that acknowledge a supreme being, McBride's allusions to his own faith are subtly rendered that one believes that he has taken the admonition of a universal craft seriously, and he only references his own faith when he does because it is his own frame of reference, or merely the references he makes are so conventional that it serves as a general point of reference. No hidden apologia or proselytizing hints are present in his work in an age which such appeals were rife. His study of, of the law of the square in the cross deals with the history of the cross as one of the earliest human markings and places it more correctly in its geometrically symbolic context rather than as the emblem of any one faith. That chapter challenges us to understand that emblem in more ways than one. Indeed, Part of the appeal of McBride's work is that it lacks an evangelical tone on any other matter than Freemasonry itself. The next concern of the book is the evolution of the craft, which is McBride's attempt to offer a history of Freemasonry. Now, every Mason who tries to associate points of origin or correlation between non-Masonic entities before the Grand Lodge era is going to have problems. The difference here is that McBride is brutally honest about this, beginning his own words on the subject with the following. In no branch of history is care and judgment more needful than in that of masonry. Nowhere else will you find such a collection of mendacious tales, such outrages on truth and common sense, as in the so-called histories of Anderson, Preston, Oliver, Lorry, and some other writers. These publications have created contempt in the minds of, and the minds of non-Mason critics, not only for the authors, but also for Masonry itself, and no doubt, this is the reason why historians generally neglect the Masonic field. However, he then goes on to add his own estimations of newer, more supposedly accurate histories, which themselves may or may not be accurate, and therefore this section of the book is, in my humble opinion, the weakest area of the book and the most derivative. It closely resembles countless other condensed narratives on the prehistory of masonry, which owe far more to the voluminous works of Gould and Hewan, which many brothers have collected that few have actually ever read cover to cover. Now, it may well be that McBride thought this to be a necessary element of the book, insofar as it provided ideas regarding what we would today call frequently asked questions as to the where's and when's of the craft, because after taking the time to examine a number of explanations related to origins, he ultimately ends with the following conclusion. What then is the conclusion we come to in connection with the origin of free or speculative masonry? It is a subject on which no one can presume to dogmatize. The only clear point is that since 1717, its organization has, with certain exceptional developments and modifications, been practically the same. Previous to that time, our information is hazy in character and limited in details, and the further back we go, the less certain the pathway becomes until it gets lost in the mists of antiquity. Again, an honest assessment of the history of the craft. Informative, but very honest, which I think is what's needed 
The final section of the book deals with landmarks. McBride shines when he's talking about the structure of the craft, its foundation, and how we are to understand its intended impact on our individual lives. This all comes to a wonderful crescendo in this final section of the book, dealing with the landmarks of speculative Mesa. His exposition on the concept of Masonic landmarks is quite possibly the most overlooked, yet most accurate analysis of how these, at times confusing, building blocks of Freemasonry should be understood. The chapter on misconceptions regarding the landmarks is quite possibly the most brilliantly incisive Masonic writing of its time, and the message is just as valid today as it was then. After painstakingly explaining to the reader what a Masonic landmark actually is, McBride takes a sharp turn, and then in multiple ways, on multiple themes, McBride rails against the arrogance of ignorance in the fraternity. It has been pervasive, he asserts, and McBride excoriates it mercilessly when dealing with the matter of what so many Masons have propagated as truth about critical aspects of the craft. Obviously, there are reasons why we have landmarks and why we should have them. But McBride rightly calls out the arrogance of those who do not and never did properly understand them, all the while allowing their ignorance to compel them to issue any number of misguided proclamations and determinations regarding them. Consider the following thoughts which might strike a familiar chord in our minds today. In the second degree, we are told that masonry is a progressive science. How can this be if everything is fixed and unalterable? The absurdity of the idea that our rituals are fixed word for word and letter for letter can perhaps be best realized if we ask those who hold this notion, why do you not work in Hebrew? According to your own reasoning, you should work in the language of King Solomon and the builders of the temple. What right have you to introduce such a modern innovation as the English language onto the work of masonry? Is this not breaking the ancient landmarks of the order? Now, I have to say that I myself have been saying something like this for years regarding Chaucerian English and the subject of tradition related to Masonic ritual before I ever knew who McBride was. And then he goes further on this question of the uniformity of ritual. But a further question arises with this misconception. Which of the various existing forms of the ordinary ritual is the right one? You will scarcely get two lodges alike in expression and idea. Who is to determine what is the true form? Many brethren are much exercised on this matter, and there is an inclination with some to get a hard and fast ritual enacted by Grand Lodge law. There could scarcely be anything worse than this for the best interests of our order. There may be certain inconveniences and variation, but these are nothing to the evils of a hard and fast ritual. Such a ritual goes right in the teeth of natural law. Variation and differences in form and expression are real advantages. But you have every, grade of bla uh, every blade of grass and every flower and tree fashioned in one mold. Do you think this would improve God's work? Where then would be the beauty, delight, and education of its infinite variety? Dead uniformity is slavery. It is a curse for freedom, development, and individuality. We have at present several variations in the form of our ceremony. Let us thank heaven it is so. We cannot, and nobody can, say which is the correct form, and for this also may the Lord make some of us truly thankful. And finally, there are certain members of our craft, when they see or hear anything in a lodge to, would, to them is new, cry out that it breaks the ancient landmarks. They may not have clear ideas of what the landmarks are, but they resent anything being put forward as masonry which they do not know. They know all about masonry, and therefore anything not known by them cannot be mason. Brethren, the man who knows all about masonry lives not on this planet. Beware of the man who pretends he knows all about anything. You usually find he really knows very little. The more a man knows, the more he discovers the greatness of his own ignorance. And the more learned a mason is, the less he is inclined to assert anything about the ancient landmarks. In closing, brethren, when 
one takes all of these things into consideration, we find that Andrew McBride is a voice not only from the past, but also very much applicable to the present. Unbeknownst to most Masons, unsung even in his own country for the most part, he nonetheless identified and spoke to so many of the concerns that 21st century Masons have about the craft. He wrote, The ritual is the sound of Masonry, but you must find the soul in the sound. More than a mere process of memorization and repetition, McBride seeks to communicate to his brothers that the ritual, which is and always has been the core of our art, must not be something that is just done in a perfunctory sense, but an object of meaningful study, something to be internalized, so that indeed one can find the soul in it. His poetic work serves as a remarkably strong blueprint for masonry as a philosophical art, by putting the mind of the mason in a place where he can fully receive that philosophy. He is more than what one might call him a classic Masonic author. He is a voice in the wilderness speaking to the mason of the present day, and therefore that voice should be heard by the present day mason. Newton. Newton was likely the most prolific author of the four men whose works are featured here, best known for his book, The Builders, a story and study of masonry. Newton, who was a Protestant Christian minister, combined his appreciation for history with his search for the spiritual aspects of Freemasonry. Newton's theme, to which he returned again and again, was the power of Freemasonry to unite men in bonds of friendship. So this presentation is titled Newton's Law, the restorative work of Joseph Fort Newton. And the Newton's Law part is a play on words. Joseph Fort Newton would have never presumed to regard any of his thoughts or opinions on Freemasonry to be law. But as I, as I think we'll see later, some of his observations occur just as surely as the law of gravity attributed to Enlightenment-era scientist Isaac Newton. But calling the work of Joseph Fort Newton restorative is firmly rooted in fact. If you could have asked Newton to describe Freemasonry in a single word, it's likely that his answer would have been friendship. To Newton, that was the essence of Freemasonry. He understood that Freemasonry's promise to unite in bonds of brotherhood men who otherwise would have remained at a perpetual distance made it a source of tremendous hope for mankind. And Newton found in Freemasonry the promise of peace, of justice, and fulfillment, or said in a different way, Friendship, morality, and brotherly love. Things that all men of goodwill seek. Newton's work is restorative in the sense that he sought to inspire Freemasons to engage in the work of grounding newly admitted brothers in those principles in such a time and in such a fashion as to start them on a journey to actually being made Masons as opposed to merely being made members of the Masonic Lodge. Doing anything more than superficially discussing the work of this brilliant and prolific writer within the time allotted this morning is impossible. So we'll try to look very briefly at the work of Newton on two levels. At the larger level, we'll look at how Newton viewed the mission and the ministry of Freemasonry as being restorative. And at the smaller level, we'll look at some of Newton's opinions and suggestions with respect to the delivery of Masonic education and, indeed, Freemasonry. But first, let's get acquainted with the man, Joseph Fort Newton. The best way to get acquainted with Newton is by allowing him to tell his own story, which he did quite eloquently and very honestly in his 1946 autobiography, River of Years. Written in the most compelling prose, River of Years is available still through online booksellers. It's easy to conclude after reading Newton's autobiography 
that if any man could ever be said to have Freemasonry hardwired into his system, that man would surely be Joseph Fort Newton. Newton was born July the 21st, 1876 in Decatur, Texas. His father was Lee Newton and his mother was Sue Battle Green Newton. At the outbreak of the Civil War, Lee Newton enlisted as a, Confeder as a Confederate soldier from Texas. Lee Newton was made a Mason in one of the traveling military lodges that were so frequently found among both of the armies. Taken captive at Arkansas Post, Lee Newton was transferred to a prisoner of war camp at Rock Island, Illinois, and there he became gravely ill. And upon learning that Lee Newton was a Mason, the commanding officer of the prison camp ordered the apparently dying soldier removed from prison transferred to his own quarters, the Commandant's quarters, and nursed back to health. In more comfortable surroundings and benefiting from effective medical care, Lee Newton recovered his health, and at the end of the Civil War, the camp commander furnished the elder Newton with the funds necessary to return to his Texas home. In River of Years, Joseph Fort Newton recalled how, as a boy, he would listen as if mesmerized to the story of his father's illness and recovery while a prisoner of war. But always, the point of the story was the heroic action of a brother Mason who acted to save his father's life. Sadly, in 1883, Lee Newton died at a relatively young age. And the, again, the image of Masons gathered around his father's open grave was burned deeply into the mind of six-year-old six Joseph. Joseph Newton later recounted, how the local Masons quietly rendered aid to his widowed mother following Lee Newton's death. Now, Lee Newton had been a Baptist minister, but left the ministry and became a lawyer. In 1890, 14-year-old Joseph also felt the call of the divine, and in 1895, at the age of 19, was ordained as a Baptist minister. Newton recounts feeling conflicted at the time of his ordination due to his inability to wholly accept Baptist doctrine as being authentic, authentically scriptural. Immediately after his ordination, he accepted the pastorate of a small rural Baptist church. He quickly came into conflict with members of his congregation for not being, in his words, a damnationist. In examining Newton's later career as a Freemason, it's important to remember this example of Newton's general outlook. As we'll see, Newton's orientation was one of conciliation and reconciliation. He viewed Freemasonry as a vehicle to promote friendship among men, or, if you will, the restoration of friendship among men. And that attitude was replicated in the theological course that he followed. Although he had had very little formal schooling in 1895, at the age of 19, he enrolled as a student in Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And for those of us who are Kentucky Masons, we can feel some pride of kinship to a certain extent, as we'll see in just a few minutes with Joseph Fort Newton. So four things occurred while Newton was in seminary that had a profound effect on his life. The first and probably the most obvious of those four things was that he met his future wife, Jenny May Deathridge of Sanders, Carroll County, Kentucky, and to whom he would affectionately refer for the rest of his life as Lady Brown Eyes. Next, he served as an associate chaplain for a state prison in Indiana, just across the river from Louisville. This served as Newton's first prolonged ex exposure to society's criminal element. He was certainly no bleeding heart. Newton described the prisoners as, not, as being not immoral, but amoral, and determined that they were exactly where they needed to be. Third, he worked for a, a brief period of time for the Courier-Journal, the Louisville newspaper edited, edited by the renowned Henry Watterson. Now, in River of Years, Newton relates how when he was a boy at home, his family in Texas subscribed to the Courier-Journal by mail. They would get copies of the newspaper sent from Louisville down to Texas. Henry Watterson, the editor of the Courier-Journal, was one of the most, if not the most, famous editor in the United States at around the turn of the century. So Newton had already been inspired by Watterson's writing, and for him to go to work at the Courier-Journal working for Watterson was a real coup for Newton. 
So Newton was the news, was the paper's reporter for religious news. And again, think about this in the context of 1900 Kentucky, 1900, you know, the 1900s in general. Religion was a big deal. Newspapers reported on who was preaching where and what their sermons included. So it was not at all unusual for a newspaper to have a religious news reporter. And that's what Newton did for the Courier Journal. He recounted several conversations that he had with Watterson, and he credited Watterson with helping him develop his style of writing and speaking. Watterson told Newton, A minister is often content to get ideas out of his own mind, but a journalist must get them into the minds of others. And clearly, Newton's later writings exhibit the extent to which he took Watterson's advice to heart. And finally, as a result of a theological disagreement, between a faculty member and the administration at Southern, Newton began to seriously question his own understanding of God and started on the path that would eventually redefine his own theological beliefs. In 1897, Newton left Southern Seminary without having graduated. He made his way back to Paris, Texas, and he became the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Paris. His theological differences with the rigidly sectarian Baptist doctrine finally became too much, and in 1899, he resigned his pastorate, and he left the Baptist Church. He moved to St. Louis, where he became affiliated with the non-sectarian Church of St. Louis, and that was the name of the church, the non-sectarian Church of St. Louis. He maintained a long-distance romance with Jenny, and the two of them were married in Louisville on June 14, 1900. After serving for a brief period of time as a itinerant preacher and something of a drop-in student at Harvard, Newton and Jenny headed for Dixon, Illinois, where in 1902 he became pastor of People's Church. And as pastor of People's Church, Newton distinguished himself in at least three different respects. He began a series of, of Sunday night talks called Great Men and Great Books. And I think much like Brother Montica told you last night, Newton had discovered that you could have a dialogue with books. And he um, exhibited that discovery and exhibited his knowledge of that by having these programs on Sunday nights at his church where he would explore the writings of great men and great books at that particular time. These, these Sunday evening meetings proved to be quite popular, and they attracted large, large crowds to people's church. And Newton was nurturing what would prove to be his lifelong love for the written word. Further, in a very interesting turn of events, Newton became known as the actor's chaplain. Now, being a professional actor in the early years of the 20th century, again, think context, was not a respectable vocation. Newton agreed to christen the, the children of actors when no other minister would do so, and thus found a new group to whom he could extend his ministry. He was later formally appointed as a chaplain of the Actors' Church Alliance. And again, there's another example of Newton's conciliation and reconciliation among men. And finally, Newton became a controversial figure when he was in, denounced by evangelist Billy Sunday, who came to Dixon for a revival. Billy Sunday announced that there was one pastor in Dixon for whom he would not pray. And Billy Sunday went on to say the doctrine of the universal fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man is an infernal lie. And that was a contradiction and a condemnation of the core of Newton's religious beliefs. Newton said that Billy Sunday's pulpit theatrics were a ghastly caricature of religion. Now, importantly, while in Dixon, Illinois, Newton became a Mason, being initiated, passed, and raised in Friendship Lodge No. 7. But as we'll see, Newton's initial experience in Freemasonry did not overshadow the great contributions he would later make to the fraternity. Writing in his book, Short Talks on Freemasonry in 1928, Newton described how, because he could find no one to guide him in his search for the history and philosophy of Freemasonry, he gradually just drifted away from the lodge. In 1908, Newton moved to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where he became pastor of the Liberal Christian Church. And again, that was the name of the church, the Liberal Christian Church. It was a universalist church. 
While in Cedar Rapids, he affiliated with Mount Hermon Lodge 263. In Cedar Rapids, Newton published the, his first two books. And the first of these was a biography of Chicago preacher David Swing, who had been a tremendous influence on Newton's life. And the second was the product of Newton's admiration for Abraham Lincoln. Newton was able to make the acquaintance of the man who had served as a physician to Lincoln's former law partner, William Herndon. The young pastor was provided with original source documents related to Lincoln and his early law practice. Newton's book, Lincoln and Herndon, was published in 1910. The success of these two books, coupled with Newton's growing notoriety as a preacher, indirectly led to his next book, The Builders, A Story and Study of Masonry, which although published in 1914, is still considered a classic Masonic text. Newton told the story of how he went to Lodge in Iowa, perhaps it was Mount Hermon Lodge, and he, in his words, he was so rusty that he was barely able to convince the Lodge members that, in fact, he was a Mason. He began to ruminate on whether there was a little book that newly made Masons could be given to help acquaint, him, acquaint them with the history and philosophy of the order. Hearing Newton's question about such a book, Iowa Grandmaster Lewis Block suggested that Newton himself was the right man to write such a book. In The Builders, Newton wrote, Manifestly, since love is the law of life, if men are to be won from hate to love, if those who doubt and deny are, are to be wooed to faith, if the race, and he meant the human race, is ever to be led and lifted into a, a life of service, it must be by the fine art of friendship. And inasmuch as this is the purpose of masonry, its mission determines the method, not less than the spirit of its labor. Reviewer and William O'Ware research fellow Bill Lorenz wrote of the builders, throughout the book, the reader will find Joseph Fort Newton's belief that Freemasonry's role is to unite men of every country sect, and opinion, and the Freemason's duty is to be gentle in controversy as well as harmony, to display brotherly love and honor to those around him, and to be grateful to God for the opportunity to do so. Included in the Builders is a poem that Newton wrote that's become familiar to Masons worldwide. You've likely heard the poem before, but you may not be aware that Newton's the author. The poem is, When is a Man a Mason? And again, if you're a Kentucky Mason, you'll find that poem's included in Pertle's Kentucky Monitor as well. Please join me here. When is a Man a Mason? By Joseph Ford Newton. A man is a Mason when, when he can look out over the rivers, the hills, and the far horizon with a profound sense of his own littleness in the vast scheme of things, and yet have faith hope, and courage, which is the root of every virtue. When he knows that down in his heart, every man is as noble, as vile, as divine, as diabolical, and as lonely as himself, and seeks to know, to forgive, and to love his fellow man. When he knows how to sympathize with men in their sorrows, yea, even in their sins, knowing that each man fights a hard fight against many odds, when he has learned how to make friends and to keep them, and above all, how to keep friends with himself. When he loves flowers, can hunt birds without a gun, and feels the thrill of an old forgotten joy when he hears the laugh of a little child. When he can be happy and high-minded amid the meaner drudgeries of life. When star-crowned trees and the glint of sunlight on flowing waters subdue him like the thought of one much loved and long dead. When no voice of distress reaches his ears in vain and no hand seeks his aid without response. When he finds good in every faith that helps any man to lay hold of divine things and sees majestic meanings in life, whatever the name of that faith may be. When he can look into a wayside puddle and see something beyond mud and into the face of the most forlorn fellow mortal and see something beyond sin. When he knows how to pray how to love, and how to hope. When he has kept faith with himself 
with his fellow man and with his God, in his hand a sword for evil, in his heart a bit of a song, glad to live, but not afraid to die. Such a man has found the only real secret of masonry and the one which it is trying to give to all the world. In that poem, I hear themes of tolerance, of conciliation, and the spiritual growth, the development that would hallmark Newton's later years as a Freemason and as a man. In 1915, Newton became the first editor of the Builder magazine, widely believed to be the best Masonic publication of all time. His editorship of the Builder was short-lived, however, because in 1916, he accepted the pastorate of City Temple in London, an Anglican nonconformist church. Newton was the first American called to be the pastor of that particular church, and he went to London in the midst of the horrors of World War I. And in River of Years, he recounts his experiences as a wartime pastor and as an American sojourning in Europe. While pastoring in, Freemason in London, the call of Freemasonry continued to prove irresistible to Newton. And upon the invitation of Scots Mason Andrew Somerville McBride, who Worshipful Brother Hammer so eloquently described this morning, Newton went to speak to Lodge Progress in Glasgow. Although Newton and McBride likely met in person only that one time, McBride's influence on Newton was significant. McBride had recently published his renowned work, Speculative Masonry, and Newton later caused it to be reprinted in the United States. And in fact, Newton wrote the foreword for the American version. And he frequently referred to McBride in his later writings. While in England, he wrote Modern Masonry, which was published in 1917. Modern Masonry was a very brief restatement of the salient facts set forth in the Builders. Modern Masonry was published as a part of the Masonic Service Association's Little Library series. In 1919, at the end of World War I, Newton returned to the United States to become the pastor of the Church of the Divine Paternity, again a Universalist church in New York City. His Masonic writing continued during this time. He published The Men's House in 1923 and The Great Light in Masonry in 1924. In the men's house, Newton wrote, Amidst the bitterness and strife of masonry, amidst, the bit amidst bitterness and strife, masonry brings men of capital and labor. And remember, again, think about this in context. This is a time when the labor movement, both in Europe and in the United States, was in full swing. There was a great deal of hostility between management and labor at that particular point in time. There was bitterness and strife, as Newton described. Men of every rank and every walk of life together, as men and nothing else, can unite at an altar where they can talk and not fight, discuss and not dispute, and each may learn the point of view of his fellows. Other hope there is none, save in this spirit of friendship and fairness, of democracy and the fellowship of man with man. And Newton continued to advance his most closely held point, and that Freemasonry's mission was to restore men to friendship with each other. It's worth noting that Newton's writings spanned an era that began on the eve of World War I. It witnessed the carnage of the First World War. It saw the devastating effects of a worldwide economic depression, and then survived the horror of the Second World War. And through all of this upheaval and tragedy, Newton never lost his faith in the power of Freemasonry for good or his optimism that men could be restored to unity under its banner. Continuing in the men's house, Newton offered his thoughts on how Freemasonry could directly be a source of improvement to a scarred and anxious United States. And brothers, remember this book's written in 1923, 100 years ago. What does Newton say? There are three services which masonry should render to America to, heap he to help heal it of its racial rancor. And Newton used the word race in the most inclusive sense. We would probably use the word ethnicity. It's more than just race. But to heal the rancor that exists between men because of their ethnic origin. To free it of religious bigotry 
and to build a bulwark against materialism. His view of the brotherhood offered by Freemasonry is expressed in another quote taken from the men's house. Practical brotherhood, if it has any meaning at all, means that all men, regardless of race, rank, or creed, shall have an opportunity to live and to live well, that even the humblest child to the measure of its capacity shall be admitted to the full inheritance of humanity. It will not merely be friendly to, but will forward every wise effort in behalf of a full, free, happy, useful life for all classes, and will seek to organize civilization to that end. Masonry in its organized capacity may not formulate or support definite political or social programs, but it will create and cultivate in its members the will and the passion to be champions of every cause which endeavors intelligently to build a better human order. What's the best cons community service that a Mason or a Masonic Lodge can render? To improve its members, to, for each man to improve himself and thereby improve the community in which they live. In 1924, the, in the great light in Masonry, Newton again returned to his theme of brotherhood. In the great light, Newton wrote, It is as if all the voices of the world had united into one voice of high command. Be brothers. Be builders. Live and let live. Think and let think. Do justly. Love mercy. And know that the men of the four seas are kinsmen. As always, Newton viewed Masons as builders and brothers, and his call for unity was nothing less than a call for the restoration of the family of man. Now, expanding on the ideas expressed in the Great Light in Masonry, Newton in 1924 published The Religion of Masonry, offering a larger view of his analysis of the spiritual nature of the fraternity. Newton wrote, As some of us prefer to put it, Masonry is not a religion, but religion. Not a church, but a worship, in which men of all religions may unite, unless they insist that all who worship with them must think exactly and in detail as they think about all things in the heaven above and in the earth beneath. It is not the rival of any religion, but the friend of all laying emphasis upon those truths which underlie all religions and are the basis and consecration of each. Now, it is frequently said that fools rush in where angels fear to tread. Newton was certainly no fool, and it can hardly be said that he rushed into this project, but clearly he was able to navigate the hazardous waters of illuminating the religious qualities of Freemasonry without tying it to any one specific religion. In 1925, Newton moved to Philadelphia to become the pastor of the Memorial Church of St. Paul, an Episcopal church. So we have seen him move from Baptist to Congregationalist to Unitarian to Anglican, now Episcopal. In 1926, Newton was ordained as a priest in the Episcopal church. His writings were not limited to Freemasonry. He published several volumes of his own sermons and edited various editions of Best Sermons of the Year, a book that was published annually. His personal notoriety increased when he was named one of the top five Protestant preachers in America. His Masonic writing continued apace with the publication of Short Talks on Masonry in 1928, and apart from his autobiography, River of Years, uh, Short Talks on Masonry is probably my favorite of Newton's works. Here I find him to be at his most eloquent. And it's also here that we begin to consider the more immediate question on his views on, of how and when to educate Freemasons. Listen as Newton poses questions to his readers. As the gavel sounds in the East, calling us to another year of Masonic labor, each of us ought to ask himself such questions as these and answer them honestly with his soul. What kind of lodge would my lodge be? if all of its members were like me? What value would masonry be to the world if every one of its sons made the same use of it as we do? Do we answer the signs and summonses as we vowed to do at, at the altar? If not, what's a Masonic obligation worth? And what does it mean? 
nothing? Such questions tell us where we are in masonry and why we do so little with it. Now consider that phrase, why we do so little with it. Certainly, because of neglect and disinterest, it's easy to tell when men, when lodges, do very little with masonry. But in this room today, there are some of the most active and engaged masons probably in the world. And I mean engaged fully, physically, intellectually, spiritually, emotionally. And yet, honestly, I think each of those men can probably say, yes, we do very little with it. That phrase, I think, not only speaks to human frailty, but it also illustrates the vastness of the potential of Freemasonry. Freemasonry is so large, and its abilities to transform the lives of men are so great that it, at our very best, I think we're only able to do little with it. Our challenge, though, is to use what talents we have to employ the vastness of Freemasonry. Again, writing in Short Talks, he wrote of Masonic education as an obligation, not only of men to Freemasonry, but of men to each other. He said that, let us remember, a cable toe has two ends. If it binds a mason to the fraternity, by the same fact it binds the fraternity to each man in it. The one obligation needs to be emphasized as much as the other. Happily in our day, we're beginning to see the other side of the obligation, that the fraternity is under vows to its members to guide, instruct, and train them for the effective service of the craft and of humanity. Continuing in short talks, Newton talks about the ultimate aim and the purpose of Freemasonry. Again, this is a restatement of his earlier words. Here lies perhaps the deepest meaning and value of Freemasonry. It's a fellowship of men seeking goodness. Again, a fellowship, conciliation, reconciliation. To yield ourselves to its influence and to be drawn into its spirit and quest is to be made better than whom? Better than ourselves. In Short Talks on Masonry, Newton again recounts his visit with Andrew Somerville McBride in Scotland. You should have a handout in front of you, which is an excerpt from Short Talks on Masonry. And in that particular handout, you have the portion of the book where Newton talks about meeting with McBride. And it talks about the influence of McBride on his work. McBride's conversation with Newton was about the employment of intenders or mentors and that made a deep impression on Newton. McBride's influence is clear in Newton's declaration that there could be no defensible claim that masonry had been imparted in a manner pure and unimpaired from generation to generation. He not only called for more attention to the consequences of the deficiency in adequate Masonic instruction, but he offered a sensible solution that had, that had begun to formulate as early as 1915 while he was the editor of the Builder magazine. He wrote that the editor of the Builder, or the editorial board, had a hold of a big idea, but we had it by the wrong end. Newton saw that while the magazine was able to assemble a goodly company of brethren who were students of Freemasonry as readers and writers, yet in comparison with the number of Masons in America, they were very few and hardly a drop in the bucket. With McBride's guidance, Newton recognized that the issues surrounding inadequate or absent instruction were not going to be resolved by books and journals, and that research societies could never do the thing that needed to be done simply because too many members were already insufficiently instructed in the fundamentals of masonry. And as previously pointed out, in making matters worse, those who were insufficiently instructed now held leadership positions at all levels of the fraternity and thus perpetuated the problem. He proposed a way out of what had become a deeply embedded and routine practice, and he spent the next several decades and his influence as one of the most widely read Masonic authors in the first half of the, of the 20th century, encouraging grand jurisdictions and their subordinate lodges to explore and employ the idea. And what was that idea? It was a common sense approach. If there was adequate instruction about masonry, instructed sufficiently as men entered the ranks and passed through the degrees, giving them sufficient time to learn and absorb the meaning of each degree before passing them on to the next. 
or presuming that once made a Master Mason, they would automatically pursue the understanding of the degrees necessary to become real Freemasons as opposed to merely being members. Continuing with short talks on Freemasonry, Newton said, There it is, beyond doubt, the plan and method that we need. It takes a young man at the time when he's ready to know. It links the study of Masonry with the ritual as it should be, and it's done in an atmosphere which not only the facts, but the spirit, the feel of Masonry can be communicated. Newton called for a collective agreement between jurisdictions, not to establish a uniform ritual, as many before and after him would do, but to make a concerted and collective effort to establish and use a functional, fundamental course of instruction for each degree of Masonry beyond what was offered by merely being exposed to ritual. There was something the mass of our culture believed then, and in the multiple decades preceding Newton and still today that's already done through the long-standing customary practice of advancing men through the degrees with a minimum of 30 days between them. Like other learned Masons of his period, he voiced the folly of presumptuous, presumptuously bestowing upon candidates the title of Master Mason and then simply bidding them to be fruitful and become Freemasons, pointing out that if that approach worked well, there would have been no recurring calls to address the matter since the middle of the 1800s. Such an essential instruction process as Newton proposed has worked in business, corporate America, the military, and the field of academics for centuries. Although masonry is none of those categories, there is no legitimate reason that has ever been put forth that indicates that that practice would not work for the institution of Freemasonry. Those who may claim that that approach cannot work demonstrate their lack of awareness of what has been happening in lodges since the 1900s that have adopted even a modest effort to approach the program as proposed by Newton. Newton was committed to the idea and wrote in his work that the plan was neither Im that the plan was neither impossible nor impractical if grand jurisdictions and their subordinate lodges would be wise enough to use it. Blending that early optimism with a hint of doubt, he slyly noted that surely a grand lodge ought to be as eager to have at least an elementary of knowledge of what masonry is imparted to its young men if they really mean business in the matter of Masonic education. Hear Newton one more time from his own words in Short Talks on Masonry. Such a plan is neither impossible nor impractical if we really mean business with respect to Masonic education. Newton's career as a pastor continued apace alongside his involvement with Freemasonry. In 1930, he became the rector of St. James Church in Philadelphia, and he remained there for five years. From 1935 to 1938, he was a special preacher for the Associated Churches of Philadelphia, again under the auspices of the Episcopal Church. In 1938, he accepted the rectorship of the Church of St. Luke and the Epiphany in Philadelphia, and he remained in that position until his death from a heart attack on January 24, 1950. He was 73 and a half years old. One of the true Masonic luminaries of the 20th century, Joseph Fort Newton, added his name to the long list of Masons who equally recognized the consequences of our absence of adequate, vital instruction throughout Freemasonry and our negligence in guarding the West Gate. Newton found that convincing jurisdictions to adopt such a dramatic diversion from that to which the Masonic culture was used is accustomed, to bend, is accustomed to being like bending granite. The opposition to the recommendation and replacing the all-you-need-is-ritual approach proved insurmountable, at least collectively. Newton's law, as applied to contemporary Freemasonry, may be expressed in two thoughts. First, that Freemasonry is, and always has been, and forever will be, a vehicle for the restoration of friendship and brotherhood among men. Second, that the restoration of the vitality of Freemasonry rests on its determination to address the issue of educating and engaging its brethren from the right end as they move through the, de through the degrees at a measured pace. Allowing Newton to have the last word, such a determination is neither impossible nor impractical 
and indeed it is essential for our institutions if we really mean business in the matter of Masonic education. You heard in Worshipful Brother Hammer's presentation this morning that there is a connection between the work of McBride and the work of Newton. I think you'll hear later today that that same connection exists in the work of Dwight Smith and the work of Thomas Jackson. My brothers, there is a bright line that connects the work of these men. And that work is merely, and that line is simply this, that it is the job of each of us and each of our lodges to continue the work of Masonic education from the right end. And the right end is when men are passing through the degrees so that as we pass them from one degree to the next, they are grounded in the meaning, the philosophy, and the nature of Freemasonry. Smith. Smith, a past Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Indiana, is best known for his phrase, try Freemasonry. Smith stood out among 20th century Freemasons for his willingness during a time of unprecedented membership gains to ask if Freemasonry was becoming too big. He suggested that the purpose of the craft was to get masonry into men and not merely get men into masonry. His book, Look Well, was designed to help senior wardens prepare for their year as master of a lodge. Unsurprisingly, Smith urges prospective masters to provide good and wholesome instruction for their brethren. If you belong to a so-called traditional observance or observance style lodge, or if you're considering joining one or starting a new one, or if you're familiar with the Masonic Restoration Foundation and its materials, then you may very well be acquainted with some of the writings of Dwight L. Smith. You may have read his two booklets, Whither Are We Traveling and Why This Confusion in the Temple. In fact, after the literally hundreds of articles that Dwight wrote in the course of his lifetime, he's primarily known most for the contents of those two relatively short works. You may have also read a follow-up booklet from the early 2000s called Laudable Pursuit by some outfit calling itself the Knights of the North. But unless you're a Mason in the state of Indiana, you might not really be aware of who he really was. And in fact, most of our own members don't even know anymore. More's the pity. So as a past master and now the current secretary of Dwight L. Smith Lodge of Research in Indiana, as well as the director of our Masonic Library and Museum, I spent a lot of time with Dwight. I was commissioned by the Grand Lodge of Indiana to write a follow-up history book to his 1968 volume, Goodly Heritage. Uh, back when we celebrated our 200th anniversary in 2017. I don't know how mine compares, but I sort of leave it to other readers to decide whether it's a worthy successor to Dwight's work or just an improper use of a wind instrument. So, Right worshipful brother Dwight Lewis Smith, past master, past grandmaster, past grand secretary of the Grand Lodge of Indiana, chairman of the Conference of Grand Secretaries of North America for 21 years, author, editor, playwright, historian, grand cheerleader, grand curmudgeon, grand pest. Even today, so long after his retirement and then his death in 1993, he's not remembered as past Grand Master Smith or past Grand Secretary, worshipful brother Smith, or even Dwight Smith, we know him principally just as Dwight, even to many of us like myself, who've never, who have never actually knew him in person. And I want to tell you about him today to help you understand why our research lodge is, is named after him and why it's important that we all keep to the mission that he gave us as Freemasons back in the 1960s. Dwight was born in 1909 in the tiny town of Penville in northeastern Indiana, just across the Ohio border. He graduated from Indiana University in Bloomington in 1932, where he trained as a news reporter. Two years later, in 1934, Dwight had just turned 25. He married his college sweetheart, Adelaine Griffith, who was a fellow small-town Hoosier. They both belonged to the Society of Indiana Pioneers, which required its members, and still do, to be descended from original settlers in the days of the territory or the earliest years of statehood. 
Between Dwight and Adelaide, they counted 16 different ancestors who had all settled in Indiana prior to 1838. Besides marriage, 1934 was an important milestone in Dwight's life for another reason. He petitioned to become a Freemason in Penville Lodge No. 212. A right after being raised as a Master Mason that year, Dwight was offered a dream job in southeast Indiana, especially as relatively young out of college. He was named as the editor of the Salem Republican Leader newspaper in Salem, Indiana. So he and Adelaine packed up and they moved south to Salem, where he transferred his membership to Salem Lodge 21. And then just three years after joining the fraternity and moving to a brand new lodge, he was elected as their worshipful master in 1937. Lest any of you think that Masons with so little experience weren't allowed to hold such an office back in those mystical good old days. Now, I'm comforted by that since my own lodge did it to me in two and a half years, so at least Dwight got three. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, Dwight secured a commission as a first lieutenant in the U.S. Army Reserve, but he was rejected for active military service, and he was honorably discharged. He was handed the reins of the state's uni- uh, fraternity in 1945 as his Grand Master at the age of 36, just 11 short years after he joined the fraternity. The war in Europe had just ended the month before, but the May 1945 annual meeting took place while battles were still raging in the Pacific. Even this early in his career, Dwight was passionate about Masonic education, and he'd already been part of the Grand Lodge Committee on Masonic Libraries, Education, and Research for several years at that point. He was extremely vocal about updating, enlarging, and improving the Indiana Monitor and Freemason Manual, He wanted to be thought of as a miniature Masonic encyclopedia for the members. During the course of his year in the Grand East, he strongly advocated for a program of instruction for new Masons that featured a history of the order, additional explanations about the symbols of the degrees, the etiquette of the lodge room, and much more. And also during his year as Grand Master and prior to that as Deputy Grand Master, he worked diligently with Carl Cloudy, Uh, at the Masonic Service Association during the war years on a project that Cloudy and uh, uh, now President Harry Truman uh, were very passionate about, which was opening what amounted to USO clubs for servicemen in the largest lodge buildings across each state in the country. There were eventually a hundred of them, and we had one in Indianapolis, one in Evansville, And in all these cases, it was a survey that the MSA had sent around finding the biggest Masonic buildings in the country and then having state Grand Lodges sponsor putting these in. In December 1947, 18 months after leaving the Grand East, Dwight was appointed as the Grand Secretary, and he would hold that position for a record 31 years, the longest-serving Grand Secretary in Indiana Masonic history. Grandmasters would come and go, they'd leave a mark or vanish into obscurity, but Dwight Smith remained like a cornerstone weathering the storms, the snow, and the heat year after year. He was finally replaced as Grand Secretary in 1979, but his commentary lived on for another 30 years and longer as part of the explanatory notes in the Blue Book of Indiana Masonic Law, which is our Constitution as well as in the Secretary's Handbook that he had written that the Grand Lodge distributed for decades. So emphatic that Indiana members were that these things that he wrote, his commentary, were actually Masonic law. Um, They believed his strong personal opinions were part of the regulations. And when confronted with arguments over interpretation of Masonic laws, masters and secretaries for decades would shake their heads and solemnly assure members But it's in the book. Well, it was there because Dwight put it there. Many times his commentary absolutely was diametrically opposed to the actual regulations that were in the book because he was in charge of putting the book together and he would just make his personal observations throughout the pages of the Constitution. Sort of like Thomas Jefferson scratching in all the things he didn't like about the Constitution. Masonry was tied in with the founders of the state of Indiana and and in the Northwest Territory before it, and so his interests coincided. 
Dwight had grown up living and breathing Indiana history, and it frequently was the topic of stories and editorials he would pen in the Salem newspaper. But he brought the same zeal for Indiana and its founders into Freemasonry and became a very, very active young member. He would also soon take on editing the Indiana Freemason magazine, a position he would hold officially or unofficially for more than 40 years. He took an ordinary monthly Masonic newsletter and transformed it into an internationally acclaimed, informative Masonic magazine that was subscribed to by more readers outside of the state than in it. It was very different from what it is today, and every issue contained thought-provoking Masonic education, historical accounts, editorials, news from Indiana, and the rest of the Masonic world, and much of that material was written by Dwight himself, issue after issue. Now, I'll freely admit, when we formed the Masonic Society back in 2009, I was the founding editor of our quarterly journal, and I deliberately used Dwight's philosophy as a model for inspiration when coming up with a broad cross-section of articles and features. Dwight wanted every single issue to have something that would be of interest to you and you and you and you. All of you might have absolutely different interests, but he wanted to have an article in every issue that would appeal to somebody. And that was what we did as well, following his path. In 1953, the venerated Masonic author Harry Leroy Haywood, H.L. Haywood, wrote a book entitled Wellsprings of American Freemasonry for the Masonic Service Association of North America. Haywood wrote 49 very short essays delineating encapsulated histories of every U.S. Grand Lodge that existed at that time, along with his own personal observations of each one. When the book appeared in his mailbox, Dwight eagerly flipped ahead to see what Haywood had written about the Grand Lodge of Indiana and the noble pioneer state that was its home. What he got was a three-page punch in the nose. In what was really nothing but a snarky hit piece, Haywood essentially declared Indiana masonry to be eccentric, backward, irresponsible, and dull as dishwater. He declared that, quote, Hoosiers love their cranks, and even pay them money to exhibit their small lunacies on the lecture platform. Here I am. Grand Lodge itself had a number of cranks among its Grand Lodge officers. No other state outside of New, e New England has ever raised up more Cracker Barrel sages and front porch philosophers. The only compliment Haywood could work up for the Grand Lodge was, quote, its one great hallmark, its outstanding characteristic, has been its orthodoxy. Always it has been regular, and its lodges with it. Quiet, avoiding the sensational, a loyal upholder of the landmarks. Peaceable. In other words, at least we were mostly harmless. Didn't help that Haywood had been born over in Ohio, our neighboring jurisdiction upon which he heaped nothing but praise. Even Kentucky was described shallowly but lovingly with its mint juleps, its lush horse farms, and its bourbon in a Masonic book about the history of every single Grand Lodge. Whenever Indiana Freemasonry and Kentucky Freemasonry shared something in common, for instance, such as the influences of Rob Morris and his conservators movement, in Kentucky, it was considered praiseworthy, while in Indiana, it was considered insufferable. We have no idea why. The nastiest cut of all was Haywood's pronouncement that Indiana had, quote, never produced a first-class Masonic author, unquote. Those three little pages would simmer and fester with Dwight for seven long years as he conceived and planned and researched. By the time 1960 rolled around, he knew exactly what he was going to do to wipe that dismissive smirk off the face of any other so-called Masonic luminary who dared to put such a thing in print for a second time. Nobody was going to declare Indiana Freemasonry all but worthless again, not on Dwight's watch. The Grand Lodge of Indiana had been formed in January of 1818, a year after statehood had been declared by Congress. At that time, there were five lodges in the new state holding Kentucky charters and one from Ohio. Many of the men who traveled to the riverfront town of Madison, Indiana, on the Ohio River to represent their lodges in the first historic meeting were actively involved in the new state government or their town and county councils. Many of our early members had towns named after them or counties named after them. They were truly the founding fathers of the Hoosier state. So 150 years later, 
Dwight planned to hold the biggest Masonic celebration the nation had ever seen, and much of that would highlight these founders. The term he used for the celebration was Jubilee. A tradition of Old Testament era Hebrews living in Judea was to declare a Jubilee every 50 years, to give thanks to God, to pay off all debts, to atone for sins, to forgive all enemies, to free all slaves, and most of all, to celebrate nonstop with festivals, feasts, and other major events. Between 1967 and 68, America was roiling over the Vietnam War and Israel's Six-Day War. Richard Nixon was campaigning for president against Hubert Humphrey. The U.S. space program had suffered its first fiery deaths in the race for the moon with the Apollo 1 fire that had killed three astronauts, including Indiana Freemason Gus Grissom. The assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy were just two high-profile political murders that all seemed to be happening all over the world, not just in the United States. The Soviet Union was a vast power and a dangerous adversary hiding behind its iron curtain. And China was an even greater mystery, obscured from Western eyes by an ideological and diplomatic Great Wall. Much of what formed the national psyche in the decades that followed was defined by this extraordinary and critical point in time. The new color images visible to the nation on TV were unifying, creating a common collective consciousness more than had ever been possible before. There were major riots around the world in the U.S. every day, bombings, unsettling technological breakthroughs, casualties of war. All of it spilled out into American living rooms from a limited number of networks that created a shared conception of the new age. There was a profound sense that for good or bad, everyone was passing through a time of earth-shaking change, moments in history that would be remembered in stark clarity. If ever there was a demonstration that Freemasonry in Indiana represented stability and the inverse opposite of all that turmoil and change, the jubilee year of Indiana sesquicentennial was going to be it. The 12 months between the St. John Evangelist days of 1967 and 68 were to be celebrated by Indiana's Masons like none other before. In 1960, a full seven years before the kickoff date, the Grand Lodge had named an official commission with Dwight as chairman to start preliminary discussions. Throughout the late 1950s, Dwight had been adding to a growing list of events he envisioned for the 150th celebration. When the committee was named, Dwight presented his list to them, and it was remarkably close to what they would actually wind up accomplishing seven years later. And by 1963, there were some 250 members from all over the state making up his committee. Lodges were encouraged to make their buildings as neat, clean, and welcoming as humanly and financially possible. Historic markers at important Masonic sites around the state were investigated and planned. Grave sites of the Grand Lodge's notable founders and all past Grand, Grand Masters were to be identified and repaired if necessary for the laying of ceremonial wreaths and tributes. Masonic plays were written. Public pageants of all sorts were planned. Every lodge in the state was ordered to appoint its own internal jubilee committee to chronicle their own history, identify their significant members, and send it all to the Grand Secretary's office. Masons were encouraged to contact their local newspapers, radio and TV stations, write articles about their lodges and members, or encourage reporting about them and to send any clippings to the Grand Lodge office. Dwight appointed hundreds more subcommittee members to flesh out a way to accomplish all the grandiose plans he envisioned, and lodges themselves were urged to set aside funds well in advance for the anniversary. His commission also sent out its own team of 10 researchers, really nothing but glorified butt kickers, to encourage everyone's efforts. On Saturday, June 17, 1967, the still mysterious communist nation of the People's Republic of China exploded its first hydrogen bomb and the world was stunned. It dominated the news on every continent. But it wouldn't matter. Indiana's Masons were deliberately kicking off their jubilee in style, and world events, no matter how cataclysmic, weren't about to dampen anybody's moods. The Sunday, June 18, 1967 edition of the Indianapolis Star magazine provided an illustrated eight-page feature on the Grand Lodge's anniversary year, calling it a milestone for Masons. That same morning, a new 16mm film called House Not Made With Hands began airing on TV stations across the state. In 1967, there were only three or four TV channels available for most residents, 
broadcasting over the air. Network stations for NBC, CBS, and ABC. If that, the Grand Lodge's film airing on the dominant station in every region would reach an enormous audience that was glued to their newly prolifer proliferating color TV sets. The day it premiered, it was seen by over a million Hoosiers. Now think of that. Most of the current series on Netflix and Hulu can't even claim that number for their premieres. Eh? A week later, the massive celebration for the Feast of St. John the Evangelist was staged at Clues Memorial Hall on the Butler University campus in Indianapolis. The event featured the inspirational author, lecturer, and Freemason Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, author of the worldwide bestseller The Power of Positive Thinking, a little book that kicked off the pop psychology fad in the 1960s and 70s. He was incredibly popular at the time, possibly the most famous Christian minister in the whole world, alongside Billy Graham. A sellout crowd packed the hall, which was only three years old at the time. Dwight had picked that venue quite deliberately. Clues was considered the premier theater in the state and a landmark in modern architectural design. Simply approaching it in the mid-60s just felt like you were entering the future. You couldn't have picked a more high-profile spot anywhere in the state. A brass fanfare and beef orchestra, brief orchestral piece composed just for the event was played. All the related Masonic bodies processed in, Dr. Peel spoke on the importance of Freemasonry to him and to the country, and he brought down the house. He said, I value my Masonic membership as the greatest privilege of my life, second only to my membership in the church. There is no greater brotherhood among men, and it stands for values of the utmost importance, and never was it more needed than in the life of our time. On the 4th of July, lodges sponsored fireworks displays all across the state. The Grand Lodge had employed a fireworks company to custom make mortars so that when they exploded in the air, they formed an aerial squaring compass. On August, in August, the nine original founding lodges of the Grand Lodge, or their direct success successors, assembled out of the light of a full moon and reunited in a stone quarry near Salem to jointly confer a Master Mason degree. Stadium bleachers were borrowed from the local high school and hauled down into the Limestone Canyon. 1,800 Freemasons from Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, and other jurisdictions all descended into the quarry for the degree as the moon rose above the horizon. It took 45 appointed tilers stationed around the perimeter of the quarry just to guard against any approaching cowens and eavesdrop. 1,800. Two weeks later, 122 graves of the Grand Lodge's founders, past grandmasters, and other noteworthy Masonic figures from our past were decorated simultaneously, including eight who were buried outside of the state from coast to coast. Dwight personally traveled to Cape Girardeau, Missouri, to place a wreath on the grave of Senator Alexander Buckner, the first grandmaster of Indiana, who later became one of the early senators for the state of Missouri, where he's at his grave site at the old Lorimer cemetery. November and December premiered a series of five plays Dwight had written about the early days of the fraternity. The next February, a presentation of a patriotic Masonic play called Joseph Brandt about an Indian, Indian chief who became a very high-profile Freemason uh, uh, premiered, and it was staged simultaneously by all five Scottish Rite Valleys on the same day with five different casts and crews around the state. More than 5,000 people collectively turned out to see that play. Friday, January 12, 1968, the actual 150th anniversary date of the founding in Madison, Indiana, that was Dwight's D-Day. Every Grand Lodge officer, every other possible source had been spreading the announcement for months. Clear off that Friday evening on your calendars and get to Madison, no matter what. A major snowstorm was predicted for later that evening, but there were to be no laggards and no excuses. If Indiana's earliest Freemasons had spent a week on horseback or struggling northward up the Ohio River against the current just to get to Madison in the icy cold in January of 1818, then guys from Evansville and Gary could just have to suffer the cruel privations of being stuck for a few hours in the car with bad AM radio reception and maybe getting snowbound in Madison for the weekend. Visiting grandmasters from Indiana's two parrot jurisdictions, Kentucky and Ohio, joined Grand Master John Bloxham and a small handful of dignitaries in front of what had originally been built as an inn in 1817, what we call the Schofield House today. 
They all climbed up the narrow, creaking wooden stairway and crowded into the second floor front room of Mrs. Charlotte Schofield's private home to officially convene a called meeting of the Grand Lodge of Indiana, just as they had done in that same room 150 years before. Mrs. Schofield was personally presented with the very first copy of Dwight's book of Indiana Masonic History, Goodly Heritage. And then they all assembled in front of the house with an enormous crowd and processed to the local Methodist church, just as they had done the very first day. The Founders' Day celebration in Indianapolis in January was held at the Scottish Rite Cathedral for the first time. Since it was called Founders' Day, founding a new lodge was going to be an essential agenda item. The first new lodge that requested a dispensation in 1968 was going to be named Jubilee Lodge in honor of the sesquicentennial, no matter what the members might have thought of it. Jubilee Lodge was established in Whiteland with 62 members, and they would officially receive their full charter in 1969 as Jubilee Lodge 746. They celebrated their 50th anniversary in 2018. There were countless other major events in every single month between those two important Mays between 67 and 68. Almost all of the more than 550 lodges in Indiana held some kind of celebration during those months. The April issue of the Indianapolis Freemason magazine assembled essays from three noteworthy religious leaders from across the state to coincide with National Brotherhood Week at the time. Anybody remember the old Tom Lehrer song about National Brotherhood Week? It really was a very real event, and so all of this coincided. The Jesuit president of Catholic Notre Dame University, Father John O'Brien, Brother Sidney Steinman, a nationally known Jewish scholar and head of a large congregation in Indiana, and Brother John Fleck, a retired Lutheran priest, all three wrote of the importance of Freemasonry's mission to bring together all people of all faiths. Dwight himself belonged to an extremely orthodox conservative Episcopalian church, and he was extremely well-versed in the text of the Old and New Testaments, but he cultivated numerous friendships from many religious traditions. Coincidentally, Time magazine has just published its infamous Is God Dead issue that had sparked a heated international religious debate, which made that issue of the Indiana Freemason magazine extraordinarily relevant. Even individual Masons celebrated the Jubilee. When a brother in Winchester Lodge, 56, was unable to attend any of the official Grand Lodge functions, he decided to embed a cornerstone in the basement of his own house. Packed with Masonic mementos, his lodge's bylaws, a Masonic commemorative Bible, and a U.S. flag, the inscription read it was not to be reopened for another century until 2067. The legacies of those events and the Masons who dreamed big, along with Dwight, still remain 55 years on. The Grand Lodge erected its very own custom historical markers at 27 sites around the state. There are a total of 31 of them now today. It had taken 150 years for what we call the Schofield House to be used for its second time as a Masonic Lodge when the Grand Lodge convened upstairs in 1968. Charlotte Schofield passed away shortly after the event. And late in 1972, the Scottish Rite Valley of Indianapolis bought the building from her heirs. It was completely refurbished and turned over to the Masons of Indiana. It's open to the public today in Madison's regard as one of the best restored buildings in the historic town. The upstairs room is arranged like a tiny lodge room and may be used by Masons to confer degrees in the historic manner of the early 19th, 19th century. We've had Kentucky Masons come over and do them. A few years later, using the last of the money that was left in the Jubilee Benevolent Fund, the Grand Lodge erected a tall bronze statue of George Washington created by famed artist Donald DeLue, dressed in Masonic regalia on the south lawn of the Indiana State House, appropriately facing Washington Street, as a lasting reminder of the importance of masonry to Indiana and the nation. Dwight's plan all along had been to use the Jubilee year to plant seeds all over Indiana. With the markers, the TV programming, the countless local events, the plays, the press releases, his book, and all the rest that he and his team cooked up, what he wanted to do was pass along the idea of masonry as a legacy to members young and old and to curious onlookers who might see a spark of light and knock at the door of a lodge someday. He believed in masonry and believed that passing along its stories and its history would best ensure its future survival. Dwight passed to the Celestial Lodge above on March 27, 1993. 
He'd been pressured to quit the Grand Secretary's job in 1978 because of his fading memory. In serving all of that time and being the public and private face of Indiana Masonry, he would acquire numerous friends and more than his share of detractors, complainers, and even enemies. I've been told by several past Grand Masters that it wasn't uncommon to hear a bitter Hoosier Mason at one time or another mutter, this Grand Lodge geez, needs just one single funeral and all of our problems will be solved. Eight years after being compelled to resign his office, he was already nearly a forgotten man and was booed off the stage when he commented on a resolution. Maybe that just comes with the territory of serving in the same top position for such an extended period of time. In ancient Rome, remember that a slave commonly suspended a crowning laurel of victory over the head of a conquering hero and then famously whispered into his master's ear, Sick transit, Gloria Monday, all glory is feeding, fleeting. And yet, an earlier Masonic sage, Albert Pike at Scottish Rite, famously mused, what we've done for ourselves alone dies with us. What we've done for others in the world remains and is immortal. Dwight looked ahead and saw what was coming. He saw it because he was a devoted student of the past. His goal was to throw down a challenge to all of us who would come after him, along with reminders of what came before. He knew there were great things that Masons had done and had been, and he wanted to jam as much as he could into the events of that famous year and into the 535 pages of goodly heritage. Which is why Indiana's Masons have spent 50 years saying, check Dwight's book. The answer is usually in there for yesterday and tomorrow. The influence of Dwight has certainly been blunted over the ensuing decades, as most of his opinions and footnotes have since been excised from the Indiana Blue Book of Masonic Law. But his achievements remain, and his writings are every bit as timely and applicable to the problems facing the fraternity today. Famous college football coach Newt Rockney once said, the finest work of men is to build the character of men. Dwight believed that first and foremost. His greatest fear in the 60s and 70s was the shrinking number of business executives, academics, small business owners, and other successful natural leaders who were joining Masonic lodges, those men with character and ability and experience to naturally lead other men, to oversee the fraternity and guide it, and most of all, to be the sort of good men that others would naturally want to emulate. Remember what we say in the ritual? One sacred band or society of friends and brothers among whom no contention should ever exist, but that noble contention, or rather emulation, of who can best work and best agree, that our sacred band should have no contentions, no disagreements with each other, except for the kind of disagreements that naturally occur when men are working together to solve a problem, and one believes there may be a better way to accomplish the task. It's an admonition for us all to help and cooperate with each other, and when our brethren work together to achieve that goal, those men are worthy of emulating, of imitating. Dwight's two famous and widely circulated booklets about Lodge leadership from the early 60s, Why This Confusion in the Temple and Whither Are We Traveling, remain influential. You can find them online at the Masonic Restoration Foundation website. The problems and pitfalls that Dwight cited in those two works festered, grew, and persisted 60 years later because they came true almost exactly as he predicted they would. Four decades after their publication, his writings inspired a group of similarly dedicated, mostly Indiana Masons, who followed up those works with a series of answers and recommendations called Laudable Pursuit to address those very same deficiencies that he had foreseen and warned against. It, in turn, became similarly influential in its own time and encouraged whole new generations to rediscover and revisit Dwight Smith's original works. A well-thumbed copy of Look Well, his little red volume of advice and wisdom for new senior wardens who are headed for the Oriental Chair is still passed down each year by countless lodge masters with the admonition to hand it, in turn, to their own successor at the end of their term. His Indiana book about our history remains at the top of every Indiana Mason's reference list, as well as an example for all Masonic histor historians who followed. And there are almost 500 issues of the Freemason magazine published under 40-plus years of leadership and containing reams of his wisdom, research, observations, surprises, affirmations, praises, scoldings, suggestions, and pet peeves. Just the sheer stack of the printed evidence of his lifetime 
devoted to the fraternity, provides us with an impressive legacy of work almost no other single Mason can match today. His simple advice, try Freemasonry, is as applicable to today's problems and issues as it was in the 1960s. It was almost the only recommendation he would give whenever a frantic lodge master would call to complain that nobody was showing up for lodge meeting. He'd smile to himself and he'd chuckle a bit and say, what else is new? Because he knew of letters, news clippings, minute books, and more that masters were making the exact same complaint ever since 1818. Well, he'd say, have you just tried practicing Freemasonry? By that, he meant always apply the principles and most basic teachings of Freemasonry and caring for each other first and foremost. Instead of cooking up some new scheme to interest potential candidates or some gimmick to bribe Masons into attending, he advocated a return to the basics that influence men to join your lodge in the first place. Quote, Let's try Freemasonry. I've seen nothing superior to it, and I glory in these years of adversity that may bring us to our senses with the reawakening we must have if our craft is to remain a vital force in human society. I'm proposing only that we do the work of Freemasonry, and we do it in the manner of Masons. That means, among other things, an agonizing reappraisal of our worship of bigness and wealth and material things, our passion for efficiency and know-how and quick results and public acclaim. The philosophy of Freemasonry properly applied is a power that works as slowly as quietly and as irresistibly as a grain of seed sprouting from the earth. If we've become so busy, so highly organized and centralized and standardized and mechanized and institutionalized that the individual Mason no longer counts for anything, then let's use the scissors on our rituals and cut out obsolete trivia as those promises to help aid and assist, to fly to the relief of a brother, to remember a brother's welfare, to stretch forth our hands to assist and support, to go on foot and out of our way. Let's just cut them out. American Masons, it's time we were making up our minds what it is we've come here to do. If we're here for the noble purpose we once proclaimed so readily, then we must face the sobering fact that our assignment is the improvement of ourselves, not the improvement of the institution of Freemasonry. Unless we want our craft to pass into that limbo, where things of no further use or necessity are relegated, we better learn to shift from overdrive into low gear, to become interested in men as individuals. Then, logically, the next step is to pull to one side of the road, bring our fast, high-powered vehicle to a stop, and get out and walk to go on foot and do the work of a mason the hard way. Dwight remained a stickler for dignity, high standards, and honorable behavior at all times but most especially in the sanctuary of the Masonic Lodge and the specialness of masonry itself. Some accused him of snobbery over the decades, and that wasn't the case. He was just as enthusiastic sitting in a tiny rural country lodge meeting in a room over a hardware store, in a deep-pocketed city lodge in its million-dollar Masonic Hall, or attending England's Quattro Coronati Lodge of Research in its magnificent Freemason Hall in London. He had just as much time in the little, uh, as much of a great time in the little rural lodges. It's long past time that we as a fraternity started demanding better of ourselves once again, and living up to the same expectations Dwight and generations of those who came before us had for themselves and for this fraternity. Their legacy is now ours to pass on and inspire the next generations of Masons. Nobody else is going to do it for us, and there's nobody else to blame now. Men like Dwight in just about every Grand Lodge has one or two or more of similar influence from the past. They are the sturdiest columns in the temples of our fraternity. They're the load-bearing kind of column, not just put there for decoration. Whenever columns like theirs are broken, we brethren need to mourn very deeply indeed. But then you and I need to get to work making damn sure we step up to stand in their place, to shoulder our share of the burden of leadership, in our fraternity, our communities, and more important, in the world we're briefly inhabiting. Dwight Smith had little to apologize for after devoting almost his entire adult life to Indiana's Mason. Indeed, the body of work he left us 
earned him every right to look at any critic and say, really? Show me yours. He himself had plenty of good to show for his labors because he spent his lifetime building, not tearing down. And that's a monument worthy of occasionally looking up to, perhaps polishing up a little bit every once in a while, and always remember. Jackson. Jackson, the most widely known Freemason in the world at the time of his death, was an ardent exponent of quality over quantity. His long service as Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania had given him the insight and perspective to appreciate the merits of exclusivity. Devoted to education, inside and outside of Freemasonry, he encouraged men across the globe to pursue the study of the lessons and symbols of craft masonry. Jackson's book, North American Freemasonry, Idealism and Realism is a clear-eyed look at the need for quality Masonic instruction. I came to know Tom Jackson when his reputation as a Masonic statesman was at its height. Although my 12 years of friendship with him was brief in comparison to men who knew him much longer. Tom, like the previous three authors that we've talked about today, has stretched, strengthened my appreciation for not only Freemasonry, but my understanding of the Masonic institution. He spoke directly to issues that struck at the heart of the influence of American Masonry. He never waned from his belief that we must continue to explore, understand, and appreciate the historical intent, aim, and purpose of the craft. Something that most Masons had not done for 10 decades in the 20th century. When I first became acquainted with Tom, he'd long moved from idealist about Freemasonry and the institutions that surrounded to a realist about the condition of American Freemasonry and its future. His theme and message was seasoned by his 20 years as right worshipful Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania and his legendary Masonic travels and active involvement in Freemasonry throughout the United States and 20 other countries. Tom was relentless in his presentations in which he pounded home the message that our lodges cannot ignore or remain ignorant of that historical intent of the craft and to sustain the importance, prestige, the influence on and attention of the public through which we gain our perpetuity and we depend upon. His call for high standards, quality membership versus quantity, and excellence in the pursuit of practice of all aspects of Freemasonry, not just the ones that are convenient, became his trademark. And at times, he was a lonely voice in Freemasonry until many of the presentations that he made began to find a permanent home on Masonic websites sometime around the mid to late 1990s. One of his early papers, he said, Freemasonry in America and the institutions that surround it flew the, the Masonic banner high, but the splintered flagpole on which the banner was hoisted was weak. He said that the flagpole was fragile because so many Masons and their leaders who they elected had become less interested in exploring Freemasonry and over generations had moved that historical purpose from the forefront of its labors. His views, positions were unflagging, his persistent call was to better educate Masons, and particularly for leaders to become better educated. Leaders who might return the Lodge to what it was required to do in order to restore our labors to the forefront. That included guarding the West Gate, appropriate education of candidates, and the selection and election of our leaders based on merit, 
those of you who didn't know Tom personally or have read his work know that he made absolutely no apology for his positions, and he backed them up with a mass of not only common sense, but examples that were often painful to those who embraced the notion that Freemasonry was supposed to primarily be a public charity or only a social club made up of good fellows in pursuit of good times whose organization just happened to have some mysterious past. With a firm and steadfast resolution, that's a term we should all be familiar with, he regularly pointed out those things that begged to be addressed in our fraternity to better ensure, ensure its perpetuity, and often he challenged those who may disagree to prove him wrong, especially elected Masonic officials. His presentation of a paper called Do We Even Care was delivered at the Conference of Grand Masters in a room packed with other high-ranking Masonic officials. He was six paragraphs into his presentation when he paused, he glared around the room, and he said, Freemasonry desperately needs a style of leadership today that is more committed to the philosophy and purpose of its existence than to the perpetuation of self-image. He paused for another few seconds and he looked down at the podium. And the story goes that he stepped up and under his breath, directly into the microphone, said, Does anyone care to challenge that statement? There was an uncomfortable silence, as you might imagine, in that room before Tom started speaking again. His reputation as Masonry's most outspoken and indefatigable proponent for upholding and safeguarding standards of excellence was well earned. In another of his papers and many of his conversations, Tom compared the fraternity to the story of Rip Van Winkle, who, after a long nap, could no longer accomplish anything of note because time had passed him by. After his decades long of, of that long nap, Van Winkle, as you may know the story, awakens and discovers his curious predicament. He no longer is recognizable. He doesn't recognize his own community, and his community does not know him anymore. Old Rip, as Tom would say, had lost touch and found himself unmoored from society as a result of his laziness, complacency, and his mistaken belief that his extended nap would have no consequences and that he could no longer accomplish anything of note and had nothing to look forward to but death. Now, Tom voiced his grief in many of his later presentations and his writings about how the institution had nourished his life and the lives of so many other men that they would ever have to be reminded that they're supposed to be high standards in Freemasonry. He reminded them of the damage that this notion that quantity was more important than the quality of our members and that the consequences of failing to, in, uh, to appropriately educate its voters would ultimately change the nature of Freemasonry and its place of importance in the world. He referred to that circumstance as a monumental tragedy to the institution of Freemasonry. And to borrow from Dan Kimball's comment about uh, Joseph Fort Newton's appraisal of uh, preacher Billy Sunday, uh, to paraphrase the monumental tragedy, in Tom's view, Freemasonry in America had too many lodges that had become a ghastly caricature of itself. And we don't have a film or a video of McBride, Newton, or of Dwight Smith, but thanks to Brian Evans, we do have a five-minute selection from a paper that Tom presented called What Are We Trying to Say? And the recording was made at the uh, BT Web Group Studio, which Brian operates, and he did this for the Masonic Rubicon Masonic Society, following one of Tom's visits to Lexington. Uh, we'd like to play that five minutes for you because it's going to be rare that we get to see Tom Jackson. Of course, it's filmed anywhere. It's taking a long time for his presentations to come back around. My brothers, there are very few companies in this world in which 
the Masonic fraternity is struggling more than in the United States simply to remain a viable institution. And yet there are very few countries in the world using any measuring criterion in which the Masonic fraternity showed a greater degree of success than it did in our past. It is a monumental tragedy that the Freemasonry in North America is going through what is perhaps the greatest threat to its survival that we have ever experienced, while Freemasonry in much of the rest of the world is showing the greatest success that is at its experience since shortly after its creation. Consider that 31 new regular Grand Lodges have been consecrated since the turn of the century. Why this phenomenon? Why is North American Freemasonry struggling to survive while in much of the world it thrives? Why in a civil society, perhaps impacted more than any other by the philosophy of Freemasonry, are we losing the influence we had for almost 300 years? Why do Freemasons still play a major role in most of the world's countries while our roles are decreasing? To comprehend the state of contemporary American Freemasonry, we must understand how and why. I have concluded the Freemasonry needs to exhibit its greatest success. North American Freemasonry has probably faced less challenge to its existence than anywhere else in the world. We have never been confronted by a government to prevent the practice of our philosophical purpose. We have never had religious leaders with the power to deny our way to be Freemasons. We have never faced being put to death simply for being a Freemason. This lack of challenge is perhaps a major reason why we have permitted our Freemasonry to slip into complacency that is now evolving into apathy. Almost 50 years ago, I wrote one of my first Masonic papers regarding Freemasonry in North America. At that time, my concern was focused on the decrease occurring in our numbers, the quantity of the craft. Several years after I became Grand Secretary, I wrote another paper expressing a concern, not regarding the quantity of our membership, rather regarding the quality of the men we were willing to accept the regain the quantity. Although I am still concerned with numbers, my greater concern has become a loss of our ability to influence the evolution of our civil society through the quality of the membership. In that paper, I made the observation that we have admitted for years that only 10% of our membership is ever active. Conversely, that meant 90% are never active, and yet they continue to pay their dues year after year, knowing full well that they will never be active. There is only one logical reason that a man would do that. There is a perceived value in being able to say, I am a free basin. I made then the observation that if we take away the perceived value, we risk losing the 90%. My brothers, that is exactly what has happened. In my observation over the years, I have attributed much of the success of Freemasonry to three primary causes. Number one, it was perhaps the first organization in a class-oriented society to accept all men from all social strata and professions as members and seek their knowledge room as equals. This was a dramatic change in the climate of the 1700s. Number two, it attracted some of the greatest thinking men who ever lived. These men were the respected personalities of their time, whose names remain imprinted upon the history of man. And number three, it remained selective in the quality of the man that it would accept. Not quality based upon social status of the men, but upon the ethical and intellectual standards of the individual. It was these men who created the visual image of Freemasonry to society. This attraction was primary in causing our craft to become a force unlike 
any other seed in the world. We thrived as a result of being crafted by some of the most brilliant minds of that day. My brothers, we are no longer attracting great thinking men in present day society, nor have we been selected on the quality of the man that we would accept. And that certainly is reflected in the state of contemporary American Freemason. Tom and I exchanged papers many times over the years, particularly a few manuscripts. He asked me in 2018 if I would take a look at a book that he'd been encouraged to compile that contained what he described as a few of his papers. I'd already read what I thought was everything that Tom had written, so I was eager to see what else he might have added to the few papers that he was sending. A few days later, I received a hard copy of that manuscript in a surprisingly heavy box. Heavy because it contained 948 pages of his writings, which made me question Tom's definition of a few. Those 97 papers and essays that he carefully selected later became the book North American Freemasonry, Idealism, and Reality. He published that in 2019. He said that he left out of the manuscript at least a quarter of the papers that he'd written and the presentations that he'd made. No matter, he arranged them so that they appear in a chronological order in which he wrote them and had presented them around the world. And that offers a hearty dose of insight into what eventually changed his position and views about the fraternity without ever losing affection for the craft and the historic idea of Freemasonry. While the book now serves as a vault for an account of Tom Jackson's Masonic journey, it's also a marker, too. It's a true map that shows the evolution and unfolding of American Freemasonry in the latter years of the 20th century and into the 20 and first decades of the 21st. The book preserves the common sense voice of Brother Jackson and is now a important repository of the hours of presentations that he gave around the world at every Masonic event imaginable, which include those made in countless lodges and major conferences over his 57 years as a Mason. One of the most important passages in that book is found in his essay, Why Do We Take This Road? Tom writes, There's no question that the environment in which we exist has changed. Now we must determine whether we wish to retain our principles and values and lift others to meet our standards and our ideals or change to fit the standards of present-day society. Tom's gentlemanly presence, that baritone voice of his, is powerful and is a straight-to-the-point style, left impressions on those that we refer to today as casual masons. And as he liked to note, his job was to make us think. He often said that he saw his role to preserve Freemasonry in case some great men come along sometime in the future. His early work was a clear reflection of the positive flavor and idealism he had about the greatness of Freemasonry. In the second part of that book, we find his concern increased about the continued direction the craft had been traveling, a time that he acknowledged that his pragmatism was now dominant in his thinking. This is also the period in which Tom begins to travel even more than he had in the previous 30 years. And those travels became not only extensive, but legendary. Uh, he didn't waver from his inevitable, strong-minded style, no matter the rank or the standing of anyone in any of his audiences anywhere in the world. He was persistent in asking the question of why Freemasonry didn't just look in the mirror and ask themselves, what are we doing? And where are we going? And he would specifically ask the leadership of our organizations to do that. He asked, too, that Masons remember that the more Masonry unmoors itself from its historical aim and intent, the weaker the flagpole is 
that's going to fly the banner of Freemasonry. In that end, no Mason who is capable of careful reasoning can dispute this reality of his message that was delivered to lodges, grand lodges, appendant bodies around the world, that the primary business of a Masonic lodge is first and foremost the exploration of Freemasonry. Now, he lived long enough to see that lodges and some grand lodges in America were trying to take the necessary steps to return to that primary business. In his later years, Tom spent even more time with younger Masons, and he did that, as he told me, because they are the ones who are going to constructively influence our craft over the next 20 years. And when we examine Jackson's Masonic record, we see that he was not just a popular and sought-after speaker who held multiple dozens of titles and was recognized by his work by Grand Lodges or in, in, in countries on four continents. He served as an executive secretary of the World Conference on Regular Masonic Grand Lodges. From uh, 1998 to 2014, he held numerous Masonic honors from around the world, including the founding fellow of the Masonic Society, a member of the board of the Philalethe Society, an active honorary member of Rubicon Masas Masonic Society, and this is just a few. He held honorary rank in 20 Grand Lodges around the world, including honorary most worshipful Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Iran in exile, the Grand Lodge of San Marino, and was invested with 17 medals for his contributions to the craft. As a Masonic resume or records go, Tom's other achievements take literally five pages, and those five pages, brothers, are not filled with simply the list of titles and due cards receipt. These are accomplishments. If you've not read one of Tom's books, I heartily encourage you to find one, there's only two, and read it. And once you read North American Freemasonry, Idealism, and Reality, you get an entire picture of Tom's entire Masonic journey from a perspective of someone who observed Freemasonry around the world and throughout literally every state in the United States. At least one, or all four, of the men we've talked about today can certainly fuel, and it can certainly serve to nourish your pursuit of Freemasonry and understand best its historical intent, its aim and purpose. When Tom was 87, he passed on. That was in December of 2021. I spoke with him a while when he was, or a while while he was in the hospital, a few days before he died. And still, the character of a Mason that he always had was there. He asked before we said goodbye to pass on his warm fraternal regards to all brothers at Lexington Lodge Number One and Rubicon, but especially to three young brothers. He mentioned specifically by name who were the newest members at that time of our lodge. Those three he had met on his last visit to Lexington Lodge Number One, and he spent time speaking with them throughout his visit about Masonry. He even corresponded with them and exchanged phone calls after he came home, following up on question and encouraging them. Two of those men are in the room today. He remarked that those two brothers, three brothers, I'm sorry, made a strong impression on him and fueled his hope for the future of Freemasonry. Tom's life was honored and eulogized by Grand Lodges, Appendant Bodies, Masonic publications, and websites around the world from not following his passing. He's the only Mason that I know who was given a eulogy in which Act One and scene two of Shakespeare's play Hamlet was quoted in reference to his life. That quote, brothers, is, He was a man. Take him for all in all. I shall not look upon his like again. I'll close with one final quote from Tom's book. This came from an essay titled Crafting the Mason, 
We have spent far too much time in recent years speaking and seeking excuses to justify our failures. It is far past time that we recognize that our failures are our fault. We are the ones responsible. We're responsible for converting Freemasonry in America into something it was never meant to be. And now we are the ones who must shoulder the responsibility of restoring it. I would be so bold as to say that if Tom Jackson was in this room today, he would say that the brothers in this room are shouldering that responsibility. Andrew Somerville McBride, Joseph Fort Newton, Dwight L. Smith, and Thomas W. Jackson were among the most significant contributors to the literature of Freemasonry in the 20th century. Their work lives on after them, and their voices still ring down through the annals of time. Clearly, McBride, Newton, Smith, and Jackson all agreed on the importance of the delivery of Masonic education at the crucial time, as men were passing through the degrees of Masonry. That idea is just as relevant in the 21st century as it has been throughout the history of organized Freemasonry. The Rubicon Masonic Society encourages the study of the works of these men, along with the works of other great Masonic writers who have also influenced Freemasonry over the years. If you are already familiar with the writings of McBride, Newton, Smith and Jackson, perhaps you will take this opportunity to refresh your acquaintance with them by reviewing their other works. If you are just becoming acquainted with these four men, we hope that you will peruse the full library of their respective works. Freemasonry's stock in trade is the exchange of ideas. The ideas of McBride, Newton, Smith and Jackson as far as Freemasonry is concerned, are timeless. It has been our pleasure to again give voice to them. The Rubicon Masonic Society is a private body of Freemasons based in Lexington, Kentucky. Membership is by invitation only. The Rubicon Masonic Society has been designated by the Internal Revenue Service as a charitable organization under Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code. Your contributions may be deductible for income tax purposes and may be sent to the Rubicon Masonic Society at 168 East Reynolds Road, Lexington, Kentucky, 40517, or by visiting our website, rubiconmasonicsociety.com slash donate. Your support and contributions help facilitate quality Masonic education and awareness, and for that, we thank you.